Hi, and welcome. Today we'll be hearing from Sarah Swafford, who is the founder of Emotional Virtue Ministries. She graduated from Benedictine College, and after three years of working as a residential director, she got to work face-to-face -face with college freshmen, men and women. This experience gave her insight into the hearts and minds of those transitioning from high school to college, and it's from this experience that she speaks so boldly and so passionately. Sarah has been featured on EWTN. She's appeared on the National Catholic Registrar, and she's the author of Emotional Virtue, a guide to drama-free relationships. She's bold, she's dynamic, she's a powerhouse of wisdom, and I am so excited that she'll be here today to speak to us about finding stillness in the storm. To help me welcome Sarah Swafford and her talk about how we can let God fight for us, let's give her a round of applause. Thank you, friend. Hey, hey, how's it going? Good? Yes? I got to tell you, I am so excited to be with you guys. I've been praying for this to happen. Um, I just want to thank Focus for trying this. Um, I couldn't imagine not having a seat conference. Um, I actually snuck into my first Focus conference when I, it was over 20 years ago. I know I'm 16, so I don't know how the math works, but it was one of those things where I was a senior in high school and I snuck into this conference in Lincoln, Nebraska, and there were 300 people there. And I was like, can you even believe it? Like 300 people. This is amazing. I don't know three people that are like, you know, Catholic and love Jesus. And so I snuck into my first ever focus conference and I never looked back and it's been so pivotal in my life over the last 20 years. I've only missed a couple and it's because I was having a kid. So that's how I feel about the Focus Conference. And so I want to thank Focus for making this happen because this is not easy. Putting this together is not easy. And so I just wanted, I've been praying through this talk and like what exactly I wanted to talk about. And I'm so glad that Focus gave me four and a half hours to speak on relationships and dating and the what is COVID 2020, what, what the heck was that and how it just really messed with us. And so I live across the street from Benedictine College um, in Atchison, Kansas, and so I've been listening. I, I answer all of my Instagram DMs, and I've been listening, and then I've also just been walking this road the last year of craziness myself, and this talk is going to be very real. I've never really given this talk before. Um, it's going to be straight from my heart, and I want you to know that I'm sorry for how hard this has been. I know a lot of you have been stripped. A lot of you have had things taken from you. A lot of you have had your lives turned upside down, and that includes relationships. And personally, this has been a really hard year for the Swafford crew. Um, a little over a year ago, a house came up for sale two blocks from our parish and two blocks from Benedictine College, and we just felt really called to like put in this low offer, and we got it. But we call her Bertha. She's an 1883 big old house, um, and we thought, oh, a couple months, we're gonna like you know fix it up. It'll be great. So we moved in with my parents over a year ago, and we're, we're about to move in in a couple weeks. So COVID, don't remodel during COVID. Bad idea, right? So, but people are funny. It's always funny. People are like, Sarah, how's it going? I'm like, good, good. I'm 37, married, five kids, living with my parents. It's awesome, right? Like, um, my parents are saints, praise God. But when everything hit, you know, last spring with COVID, it was hard. I mean, there was really a moment in my life where I don't know if you guys said it too, but like, what the heck, God? Like, what is this? And for me, you know, it was, I just kind of felt this radical loss of control. Anybody else? I mean, I'm a type A, firstborn, all brothers, like perfectionistic, people pleaser. There'll be therapy later, right? Like, I mean, I just, I really struggle. I mean, like Franklin Covey is like, it means a lot to me, right? Like, I just, I have this life and this plan. And when you have five kids and you, you know, have just all these things going on and then to look at your schedule and literally see it completely empty. To have things in progress, you know, doing things, you know, remodeling a house, working on things, and all of a sudden everything is just stopped. And so I felt that as an old married lady. And then as we started, kind of got into quarantine, I started getting all of this, all of these DMs and all of these conversations and friends and just the unbelievable struggle. I mean, yes, people were sick. Yes, people were dying. Yes, I mean, you could go down the list. But for a lot of us, it was also just normal life was hard. And I'm gonna be really honest with you. Like I told you this talk is gonna be very real, but there was a little part of my heart that was kind of bitter. 
There was a little part of my heart that was really annoyed. There was a little part of my heart that was scared. And there was a part of my heart that was really frustrated because I was not in control. And I felt it so vividly. And I struggled. I struggled with it. Uh, and it reminded me of a couple times in my life. Um, my husband went to grad school. He's a professor of theology at Benedictine. And there were some times during grad school, I had two babies in one year. Um, I've had miscarriages. We've had lost jobs. I mean, there's times in my last 15 years where I look back and what the heck, God, it was definitely something I was saying. And I remember very distinctly this one time where I was really struggling and I was stressing about something. And my husband just like put his hands on my shoulders and he looked at me and he said, Sarah, you will never no interior peace until you give up the illusion of control. And I was like, oh, dang it. Like, yes, like the like illusion is, it's such an illusion that you can have control. And I looked at my husband, and I was like, dang, that is so good. I was like, what saint said that? That's so beautiful. And he looked at me and he said, Master Ugwe said it to Master Shifu and Kung Fu Panda. <laughs> and I was like, oh, two points for Kung Fu Panda. Like, we won't know that peace unless we give up the illusion of control. And it's so easy to say, but it's so hard to do. So when I was asked to talk about relationships or friendships or just, you know, whatever, I was like, man, if we don't just like call a spade a spade. And what I want to do today is, again, like share my heart, but also just sit with you in the fact that Something was probably taken from you. Something was probably altered this year for you, whether it was a job or some opportunity that you had or something you've been working for, or maybe you were just stripped of your graduation or your mission trip or whatever you were looking forward to. Like, I don't know what it is, but I'm gonna, have, I'm gonna go out on a limb and say that it's probably even deeper than that. Because there's something at our core, at our identity, that was rocked during COVID. I think the two questions that we ask the most as human beings is, am I enough and am I ever gonna be truly loved? Like, am I enough and am I ever going to be truly loved? And for so long, you know, it was like social media and like trying to play like the, you know, perfect, like I got it all together, you know, confident, you know, you start competing with others, like all of this kind of, I got to keep up. And we play that game. But then whenever COVID hit, it was like, oh my gosh, I'm not even in person. I don't even, I mean, I'm kind of tired of social media already, right? Like it's, it's so, everything just kind of got turned upside down. And I'm going to guess that your, some of your relationships did too. Anybody feel totally isolated and alone during that time? Or maybe even still now? Anybody question their worth? Anybody get completely dropped? Anybody like getting ready to start a relationship and then it just completely fizzled out? And you thought like it was the one? I mean, I could go on and on and on. But at our core, I think there's that question that lingers, which is, Am I enough and am I ever going to be truly loved? And if you've heard me speak before, you've probably heard me talk about this world idea perfect or something that I promised God I would never give a talk without talking about, which is the cycle of use. And when I was in the, when we were in quarantine, I got a lot of DMs that were very dark. I got a lot of emails because I think for the first time, all the distractions were gone. For a lot of people, for the first time, they were utterly alone, and they were faced with their past. This weekend, focus conference, seat conference, I'm so grateful because I've been 20 years watching people dig deep into what it is that is truly hurting. And they dig deep into what it is that's truly going on in their lives that they can't control what it is that's attacking them, what it is that's messing with them. And so when I say it's hard sometimes to know who we are, when I say it's hard sometimes, it's easy to hide behind, I'm busy, it's, I'm good, everything is great. A girl, I, you know, I'm fine, awesome. A girl told me one time, fine stands for freaked out, insecure, nervous, and exhausted, ain't nobody fine. I was like, preach, right? Like, that's just how it is, like, we're not okay. And there are relationships that we're gonna to have to dig deep. And I think a lot of us came face to face with some of those and I heard about it a, a lot. And when I talk about the cycle of use, it's not easy to talk about because it is just, it's a topic that nobody, we don't use the word use. People don't say like, yeah, I'm just using them for a while. Like I just don't wanna be alone. Like I just operate better with a boyfriend, right? Like people don't say that. 
People don't say, like, I'm using someone to get ahead, to get where I want to go physically, emotionally. We just don't even say it. But people use each other all the time. Amen? Close your eyes for a minute, just for one minute. Close your eyes. And I want you to think about a time in your life where you were used, either emotionally or physically or maybe even both, and you knew it. Or maybe think about a time in your life where you use someone else, either emotionally or physically or maybe even both, and you knew it. Or maybe think about a time in your life where you watched your best friend or your sibling or someone that you love be used, either emotionally or physically or maybe even both, and you knew it. Or maybe think about a time where you watch someone that you love use someone else, either emotionally or physically, or maybe even both, and you knew it. Okay, you can open your eyes. Those are four of the hardest questions that I could ask you or that you could ask me, because there's not a single person in this room that hasn't felt the effects of the cycle of use in some way. Men use women to get what they want. Women use men to get what they want. Men use women. Women use men. Emotionally, physically, it's just like the cycle that we never talk about. But it's real. And I could come out and just like talk about all the ways that we could pursue relationships and do friendships and get really excited about it and be like, start start a group, start a Bible study, go, 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 go. But until we come face to face with our brokenness, And until we come face to face with our wounds and our past, we will continue to just put band-aids on gaping wounds. Amen. And I want to take a quick minute to first just speak to the men in this room, to my brothers. And I want you to hear me say that I'm sorry for the times that you have been used and torn down and emasculated by the women in your life, for the times that you've been told that you're worthless and that you're not enough. I think a lot of times women think that men don't feel and that's not true. And I think a lot of times it's easier just to like push it aside and be like, yeah, it's fine, but it's not. And I don't know if those women will ever be able to come to you and ask you for forgiveness, but I stand before you hopefully in place of them, if they never are able to do that. And I ask you for forgiveness. And I'm sorry for the times that you have not been loved well by the women in your life. And I'm so sorry for the times that you have not been loved well by the men in your life, starting with your own dads. That is an ache and that is, that is a, like a pain and a hurt that is real. And to my sisters, my beautiful sisters in Christ, I want you to hear me say that I'm sorry for the times that you have not been loved the way you deserve to be loved by the men in your life. The times that you've been used, told that you're fat, stupid, slow, worthless, ugly. I'm sorry for the times that you've been hurt by your own dads and brothers. That is real. And I was bullied so bad in seventh grade, I had to switch schools. When I, so when I say I understand that women can be cruel to women, like women can be cruel to women, and I'm sorry, I can stand before you and ask for forgiveness in the place of women. And I feel like COVID just kind of brought all of this. We had to sit with a lot of this, and a lot of you sat with this alone. And I'm sorry that you had to sit with that alone. I would have sat with you, and I'm sitting with you now. Because there is chaos in the world and there is chaos in our hearts. And I want to teach you two sentences that I want you to put in your back pocket and I want you to pull them out and use them whenever you need them. Repeat after me. I will not. I will not. Use you. And I will not. Let you use me. They are two of the most powerful sentences that will ever come out of your mouth. I will not use you and I will not let you use me. I don't know if you're going to need them like Today, tonight, this weekend. I don't know if you're going to need it next year, next month. 
but I have a feeling you're going to need these two sentences and I want you to have them ready. I want you to have them right where you need them. And here's the deal. When I wrote my book, Emotional Virtue, I had 158 pages and I just felt like it still didn't say everything that needed to be said, but there's one page in that book that I always point to. If I had three minutes with you in line at Starbucks, if I had an elevator ride with you, if I had any time with you, I would just look at you and I would say, you are the beloved son or you are the beloved daughter of God and that is your identity, period exclamation point, heart, star, smiley face. I don't care what you put behind it, but like you are a beloved son or daughter of God. And here's the thing. You can't make another human being your God. You can't, you're never going to find someone that's going to be your everything. If you're looking for that person, when you find them, if you try to make them your idol and your God, you will crush them under the weight of that. You will destroy them. They cannot be that for you. And you will always be disappointed. And that is hard to hear, but that is real. People run at each other. People run towards each other. When I want people to be running with each other towards our Lord. But when you make someone your God and you take your eyes off of him, you will crush them under the weight of that. Let God be God and let men be men or let women be women. Let them be your running partner and not your everything. You already have a savior. You don't need them to be yours, right? Like you have one. His name is Jesus Christ and he is madly in love with you. And this ache and this healing and this transformation that he wants for you starts now. That's one thing I learned from COVID is we don't know how much time we have and we don't know what plans God has for us because they can be wiped quick. But I know one thing for sure. He wants you to sit in his loving gaze and allow him to convict you of your worth and identity as a beloved son or daughter. And he wants your your squad, your tribe, your crew, the people that run with you, he wants them to run with you towards him. That's what I want for you. If I had an elevator ride with you, that's what I would, and then I would give you a huge hug because life is messy and life is hard. But we need each other. I need you, you need me. We need seek, we need elevator rides, we need hugs, like we need the whole thing, right? Like I'm so excited that there are so many little places all over the country right now. I just saw on Instagram, everyone's like getting ready, like balloons, snacks, party on. Like I love that a lot of you have just like full, you just brought your full comforter. Like why not? Just bring your whole bedspread, right? Like just get comfortable for this weekend because you're about to have your heart blown open. And we need each other. The men in this room, like I need your help. Like, I need you to be the men that are going to raise up and protect and respect and run with my women, my girls, my ladies. Like, I need you. Like, I need your help. You ladies out there, like, I need your help. I need you to be the women that are going to run together, that are going to, like, make those squads, those tribes, those crews. I don't care what you call it. Get a hashtag and a t-shirt. But, like, I need you guys to, like, run. And then I need you to look across and see the men in your life and be like, dang, I will never understand that battle. I will never totally understand these men, but like I am here to like respect and protect them. I don't want to be an obstacle to their holiness. I want to like be there for them. Ladies, when you grow with that group of women and you and the men, you fellas, like that brotherhood, there's a huge difference between a bro and a brother. A bro is someone you party with. A brother is someone that you invest in. Like I want you to find your brotherhood this weekend. I want you ladies to find that sisterhood this weekend. There are three components to a friendship that I think make a friendship. Ready? Availability, vulnerability, and accountability. Shoot me now. We hate them all, right? Like, gross. I just threw up in my mouth, right? Like, availability, vulnerability, and accountability. Availability, like, hey, I'm here for you. I don't know how many chicken wings or how much cookie dough this is going to take, but I'm here for it, right? Like, like I'm here for you. The greatest gift you can give someone, I think, is to put your phone down and give them the gift of your eyeballs, amen? Like to just be there for them. Knowing it's going to be messy, and that's okay. Vulnerability. Hey, guess what? Like, I'm struggling. I always say, like, it's not just like, are you struggling? It's what are you struggling with today, this hour, right? Like, 
Everyone's fighting a hard battle, so be kind. But to be able to be vulnerable with someone, that's a game changer. And then accountability. Look out, right? I always tell people, I'm like, if you want to watch your friendships go to the next level, give someone permission to hold you accountable. Blah. Right? Everyone's like, get this chick off the stage, right? Like, why? Like, Sarah, like, I already don't want to admit my weaknesses. I already don't want to, like, come out and say, like, I'm struggling. Now you want me to, you want me to say that, and then you want me to tell these people to hold me accountable. And I'm going to look at you, and I'm going to say yes. And I'm not going to say it's easy, but I'm going to tell you it's worth it. It is so worth it. One of my favorite stories about, like, this example of accountability was years ago when I was in RD. I was, I was in St. Scholastica Hall, and um, I took care of 142 freshman college women. So everyone's like, oh, so you got to know the women really well. I'm like, uh-huh. Where there are 142 women, there's at least 142 men. I got to know the men just as well, right? Like, I love, I love, I love the men. Buffalo Wild Wings is my favorite restaurant, and I have my own fantasy football team just to be, like, clear with all the men in this, right? Okay, we're good. Okay, all brothers. Here's the deal. These six guys knocked on my door one night. And Swaff and I were like doing dishes and stuff. And I, they were like, hey, can we talk to you, Sarah? And Swaff, and I was like, yeah. So like they came in and like they sat around my living room. This was like right around, they were about to graduate into the year. And they sat down and they were like rubbing their hands. They were like rubbing their hands like, like we, just want, we just want to talk to you. And I was like, okay. And they looked at me and they said, you gave a talk at the beginning of the year. And after your talk, we all decided to like go back. And we went back to our, our like dorm room. And all six of us sat down. We talked till like two in the morning. And each of us admitted to one another something that we were struggling with. And something, I mean, a lot of us said that we talked about things we had never talked about with other guys before. Like we talked about our struggle with pornography and masturbation and sleeping with our girlfriend and sleeping around. Like we just were so real, Sarah. Like I've never told anybody that stuff before. And these six guys in my living room, they looked at me and they said, I, I just want to thank you. Because after that night, we started a text chain. And each of us guys would, if one of us fell, we would send a text out to the other five guys. And from that moment forward, for 24 hours, nobody ate. We would fast and we would pray for each other. And they were, as they were like trying to tell me this, you guys, they like started crying. Like they were like breaking down. And I just looked at them and I was like, I was like, that's incredible. And they were like, no, no, you, you'll never understand. Like, I never knew this level of friendship, this brotherhood was possible. And I never knew this level of freedom was possible, Sarah. And I ask you, do you think it was hard to have that conversation? Yes. Do you think it was hard to send that text? Yes. But what do you think the women that married those men think of those other men? What do you think those brides think of those other men? Who do you think were the groomsmen in their weddings? I am so blessed to be able to see their faces in my head right now, and I'm friends with them on Facebook. There are all these beautiful men with beautiful families and little kids and one priest who's a rock star. And when I, when I get on stage and I like tell you like I want to share my heart with you, I'm telling you right now like this is not easy. But this is the level of friendship that I want for you, for the men and for the women. When we say COVID's hard, you can still Zoom accountability, amen? When we say that this is going to rock and alter our lives forever, that doesn't change the fact that we still need each other. And that doesn't change the fact that we still need virtue and holiness and grace and mercy and peace and freedom that the world cannot give. And so if we don't come together and figure it out together, we are just gonna be, continue to be the walking wounded. Be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. My husband is like the, he's like the Hebrew Greek guy. And he said, if you dig into the word perfect, it means whole. Be whole. I want you whole. Starting today. And you can't do that without our Lord. And you can't do that without the people sitting around you right now. They're here for it. They signed up for this. You don't have to go super far. You can just stand up sometime this weekend and be like, I want to run. Anybody with me? Like Sarah Swafford, brotherhood, sisterhood. Could someone just like hang out with me so I don't look stupid right now standing up like this, right? Like it just takes one or two of you to stand up and, and be like, let's go. But here's the two things that you're going to need. Conviction and commitment. We're not a super convicted people, amen? 
Yet the gospel, the gospels are all full of conviction. Be ready to give a reason for your hope. Go. What are you convicted in, my friends? What are you convicted in? And what are you committed to? I'm talking to myself right now, just so you guys know. This is my talk for me, right? Like, Sayers Swafford, what are you convicted in? And what are you committed to? And how do you live that out? Because the world has ideas for you. And so does our Lord. We've got two things fighting for your attention, amen? Who do you listen to right now? Who do you listen to? Because what you're watching, what you're reading, what you're taking in, who you scroll, who you follow, is forming you and your friends. And everything that I just said is not easy, but it's worth it because conviction and commitment are gonna help you to run the race, amen? It is going to get us, our whole squads, right? Our families, it's gonna get us to heaven. But if you don't have conviction and you don't have commitment, we're just a bunch of lost souls, amen? And it's very hard to do on your own. One of my like personal goals in life is just to make sure that no one ever feels alone ever again. And your campuses are full of people who feel utterly alone. Your parishes are full of young families who feel utterly alone. They've never felt this level of isolation before, the way they feel it now. What an amazing invitation for our Lord. What an amazing time for you to be able to invite them in, you guys. Invite them in. People will want to pull you into their chaos, push them into your peace. But you have to have it first, amen? That's why we're here. I have really been wrestling with Exodus 14. 14, have you guys, Exodus 14, 14? The Lord will fight your battles, you need only be still. I'm sorry, what? Right? I gotta love this verse, but it really messes with me. The Lord will fight your battle, you need only be still. Anyone else completely suck at being still? Like anyone else just completely like, but Lord, you need me to do, like, I'll, I can do this. Like, let's go. COVID was rough. The whole be still, sit, Sarah. No, that was hard, you guys. It was hard on all of us in different ways. The Lord will fight for you. You need only be still. If you remember in Exodus 14, 14, if you put it into context, we're, we're standing against the Red Sea. The Israelites have just been brought out of Egypt. What? Right? They're so pumped. All their dreams, all their plans coming true. Freedom. They're to the Red Sea. And what happens? They turn around and Pharaoh's army is charging. What would you do in that moment? Straight up panic, right? I mean, I don't know what you would do, but like I, me, I'd be like, where are my kids? Swaff, get a gun. Oh, we don't have guns. Get a machete. Get something, right? Like grab something and do something about that while I teach my kids how to swim. I don't know. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know what you would do, but I would just freak out panic. But what does Moses say? He says, the Lord will fight for you. You need only be still. If you dig into this passage, you guys, in the Hebrew, my, my swaff, my husband talks about how the word still is... The Hebrew word is closely related to silent. Here's the deal. It's not, it's, it's an interior silence, amen? And you're not gonna be able to flip it on, you're not gonna be able to flip that switch at the Red Sea. Every single thing that you're doing right now, you guys, the unseen, the unknown, where no one gives you credit for it, that I haven't left my house for two weeks and no one knows what I'm doing right now. The small acts of virtue, the small acts of sacrifice, they're like pennies in a piggy bank, amen? Be still. It's an interior calm, it's an interior trust, it's an interior confidence that says, you are God and I am not. It's an interior confidence that says, I don't even want to try to be in control of my life. And I felt during COVID a little bit of that panic. And it was a red flag to me personally because it was kind of one of those big Red Sea moments, amen? How are we gonna handle this? This is a big thing. And I remember just praying through that. I want to get better at being still. And you and I, 
are in this together because it's going to take courage. I think when we hear courage, sometimes we're thinking, oh, like, game on, you know, courage, like soldier. Like, I know how to attack. I know how to protect. It's game on, like courage. But there's another aspect of courage. That's the courage of a martyr. It's the patient perseverance of a martyr. And I think that's what we're being called to right now, you guys. 2020 and 2021, that's the question right now is, are you willing to be a martyr? Are you willing to stand at the Red Sea and say, watch what my God's about to do? Watch what he's about to do. I trust him. I don't know exactly how this is going to go down. It doesn't always look good, but like, I trust him. And I have been slowly through small little acts of sacrifice, offering back to the Lord over and over and over again. And I trust him, not just in this big moment, but I trust him because I have been leaning into him. I have been sitting in his sacred heart every day. And so I ask you, do you have the courage of a martyr? Because I want it. And I know that I'm not gonna be able to do it on my own. I need the people around me to know this courage, to show me this courage, to fight with me. I want that for you. The chaos of the world, the peace of God, the courage that we need to be convicted and committed. We need to be able to be of, like, available and vulnerable and accountable. And it is not easy. Nothing I just said was easy. But your healing is worth it. Your wholeness is worth it. I will go to my grave just trying to clear everything out of the way so that people can sit in the sacred heart of Jesus and be convicted that, he, that they are the beloved daughter or son of God. Like, that is it. That is the whole ballgame. Everything else is labels. Throw them against the wall and stand proud, you guys. Stand with confidence and courage that you are enough and you are loved. And there are people around you that want to grow with you and run with you, not at each other, towards each other, towards heaven. Game on, amen. In the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the yes of this room, for the yes of every single person that is on this Zoom call, this weekend, this conference that you are making possible. I believe in the power of the Holy Spirit and I ask in this moment, I ask you, Jesus, to place your hand on the heart of every single person. Whatever is hurting, the places that have been used, abandoned, broken. I ask you to place your hand on the anxiety and the fear and the doubt, the worry, the feelings of inadequacy. Lord God, I ask you to start that process of healing right now. I pray that you convict them of your great love for them. Maybe for the first time that they can hear you say, I love you, you are worthy, you are enough. Bring me your mess. Lord God, I ask you to raise up people to run with them. Women to run with these women, men to run with these men as the men and women then run together towards you. Help them to be available and vulnerable and accountable. Help them to feed their conviction. Help them to grow in their commitment as they grow in virtue and faith and love. And Lord God, we know that you give the peace and the joy and the freedom that the world cannot give and so we ask you to help us to trust you more to be still and to let you fight our battles, to trust you that your ways, that your love, that your will is enough. We love you and we give you all the praise and all the glory as we pray together. All glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. St. Joseph.
In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. I love you guys. I'm praying for you. I will be in my booth on the, on the platform, and I just want you to know that I'll be interceding for you this weekend. Be courageous. He's so proud of you, and so am I. I love you guys. God bless you. Thank you. It has impacted me in such a way that I can no longer live the same. It literally changed my life in so many different ways. I cannot recommend this program enough. 